A while back I reviewed the ID4 and ID40 Mark II and it was only a matter of time until Audient would upgrade the ID44 as well. And the day has finally come, so let's have a look at the features and check out the audio quality. Hey, Julian Kraus here and here I got the Audient ID44 Mark II. Quick disclaimer, Audient did send me the interface before the release, so I could already test it thoroughly. No money was exchanged, but I get to keep the ID44 to be able to make more measurements in the future. Subscribe if you want to see that. Alright then, let's have a look at the hardware first, talk a bit about the software and then put the ID44 to the test with some audio quality measurements. I did already expect a bigger interface, but the ID44 is definitely a chunky boy, both in terms of size and weight. Just for comparison, here's the ID14 next to it. So make sure you have enough space on your desk. The big benefit of the size is that the controls are very easy to reach and to operate. And you get a lot of dials and buttons to control everything on the top. Of course you get 4 dials for the analog inputs, below that you get a signal and clipping LED. I would have liked to see a level meter for the inputs and there is actually a level meter on the interface, but this can only show the output level, which I personally find less useful. The level meter is also an indicator for the volume level, which on the other hand I do find quite useful. For each of the analog inputs you have dedicated phantom power, minus 10 dB pad and high pass switches. The high pass switch does have a little dark secret though and I'll get to that in the measurements later in the video. To the right you can find a big encoder knob, which mainly controls the output volume of the main outs, but it can also function as a scroll dial when the ID button is pressed. I hope there will be more functions that you can map to this dial in the future, like for example moving your microphones remotely or other easy functions. Ok, I guess I did already mention the ID button. Next to it you get a dim button, which does exactly what the name suggests, it dims down the audio by a certain amount and you can define this amount in the software. Then there's a cut button, which completely drops the audio on all outputs, so essentially a mute button. Then you also have these 3 F buttons and a talkback button. The talkback can be configured so that it uses an input on the ID44 or even other devices like a USB mic to send your voice to a musician to tell them that they have to stop messing up takes because it's already getting late and no payment in beer is enough to compensate for that. So quite handy. Now for review I get an early version of the software, but currently I can only have three functions assigned to the function buttons and three functions for exactly three assignable buttons is a bit useless. I really hope that there will be more functions available to assign to the function buttons and I guess we are at the remote mic moving feature request again. <coughs> Jokes aside, I think there will be more functionality for the F buttons in the future. I'm counting on your audience. Last but not least, you'll also find two dials on the top to independently control the volume for the two headphone outputs. The outputs themselves can be found on the front. There are actually three connectors, one 3.5mm jack and two quarter inch one. You can use all three at once, so technically you can connect three headphones, but you still only have two volume dials and the first 3.5mm and quarter inch connection always output the same volume. On the front you can also find two quarter inch instrument inputs, which in use act as the first and second channel. I would have found it better if the instrument inputs would have actually used up channel 3 and 4, because channel 1 and 3 are actually a bit special. If we have a look at the back you can see that channel 1 and 2 do not only have an XLR and TRS combo input, but also a send and return. This gives you the ability to put outboard gear in the signal chain right after the preamp. Additionally you have the option to run your line level signal straight into the balanced return input, skipping the preamp section of the ID44 entirely. Besides that you also get channel 3 and 4, which are your standard XLR and TRS combo inputs. The ID44 also offers two sets of TRS outputs, so you can connect two sets of monitors and easily switch between the two. You also get a word clock output if you want to use the ID44 as your master clock. For digital I.O. you can find two sets of in and outputs, which can be used with ADAT and SPDIF. How many channels you can extend the ID44 by depends on the connection and sample rate, but with 48kHz ADAT you can get up to 16 in and 16 outputs. And that's in addition to your analog I.O. Now let's come to the absolute best feature, the on off switch. Ok I'm kidding, but I really like to be able to easily turn on or off an interface and that's why this is much appreciated. 
On the back you can also find a USB-C connection to connect the interface to your PC. The ID44 also needs power to be able to operate and that's provided via the 12V DC input with the provided power brick. All in all quite a lot of controls and I.O. and also a pretty nice build quality. The ID44 is entirely built out of metal and it feels very sturdy. The knobs are not the smoothest that I ever used but they are quite alright, only the volume knob makes a hollow clonking sound when pressed. By the way the ID44 does also slightly get warm when in use, that's totally normal. Ok, I guess you're equally curious what's inside. The ID44 Mark II uses a similar stacked PCB design as found in the ID4 and ID14. For the digital to analog conversion the ID44 utilizes four Cirrus Logic CS43198 and for the analog to digital conversion you will find a 4 channel ESS ES9842 Pro. Both are excellent converters according to their spec sheets but keep in mind that the performance quite heavily depends on the particular implementation. And that's what we're going to have a look at next and by the way quickly afterwards we'll also have a look at the software and round trip latency and all that good stuff. As always let's start out with the microphone input. Here you can see the frequency response which should be as flat as possible to record all frequencies equally well. In the lower frequencies there's definitely some amount of roll off but minus 2 dB at 20 Hz is really not noticeable, especially with the dynamic mics which use a lot of gain. Because with less gain the frequency response flattens right out and now it shows hardly any roll off anymore. The higher frequency area is untouched by the gain setting and it is very flat even outside the human hearing range and is then rolled off by the anti-aliasing filter which sits at half the sample rate of 96 kHz as you would expect. Technically speaking the response could have been a tad flatter at the maximum gain setting but in practice this is already quite good and the deviation isn't really noticeable. So I would say that this is still a good frequency response behavior. If you remember for each channel you also have a high pass filter switch. If you turn on the switch this reveals the 100Hz 12dB per octave filter. Here's another scale to see the response even better. Sadly this filter is a digital one and it is applied after the AD conversion. This means that turning it on will not help to prevent the input from clipping due to heavy low frequency rumble. It is literally the same as if you just placed a filter with an EQ in post and that makes the high pass a bit less useful. Also 100Hz is a bit high for my taste as this cuts quite a bit into vocals and I would have preferred an 80 or 60Hz filter. That said, because this filter is digital it would be really cool if you could adjust the frequency in the software and use the switch on the interface to toggle the filter on and off. That would increase the usefulness quite a bit, so audience, you know what you have to do. Ok, maybe it's not possible. Would be cool though. By the way the pad is really an analog one as it should be because if the signal is too strong at the minimum gain setting you can attenuate it even further to prevent clipping. Now let's have a look at distortion. In the measurements you can see that the THD starts to rise towards higher level. Would I have liked to see a better performance from an interface in its price range? Yes. Does that really make an audible difference in practice? No. Especially if you set your level to a typical recording level of around minus 18 to minus 12 dB, you're pretty much in the sweet spot so there's really no chance that you will hear this distortion. Still, I'm just a bit surprised because the ID4 and ID14 actually outperform the ID44 purely in terms of distortion on the inputs. Not that this really matters, but the measurements don't lie. In a second I will also show you a trick how to improve the technical performance of the ID44 when we talk about the line level inputs. Ok, let's check out the dynamic range, which is the ratio of the strongest signal that the interface can capture and its noise floor. You want this to be as high as possible, which enables you to leave yourself more headroom while recording without introducing additional noise. In the comparison you can see that the ID44 is right up there with the top performers, offering a dynamic range of 116 dBA. I don't think that I need to mention that this is an excellent performance. While we're on the topic of noise, let's check out the preamp performance. I'm currently speaking into an SM7B, not because it's a particularly good microphone, but because this microphone has a very low sensitivity and this is pretty much a worst case scenario for the preamps. Have a listen to the noise fluff this setup. I think we can agree that this is extremely low noise with this challenging microphone and my measurements confirm that. The equivalent input noise comes in just above minus 131 dBUA weighted, which is under the top 3 noise performances I ever measured. Here's how it compares audibly to a few other interfaces.
That's pretty impressive and this also means that you definitely do not need a cloud lifter or fathead with the ID44. That's simply a waste of money with this interface. One thing you might notice though is even when you max out the gain, the recording of a low sensitive mic is a bit on the lower side and in fact the maximum system gain of the ID44 is relatively low. That said, it's not an issue though, you can simply amplify the recording a bit in post and from my previous measurements you could see that the noise performance is going to be excellent. Looking at the line inputs, we are starting out with a frequency response again and it looks decent. There is definitely some roll off towards the upper limit of human hearing, but that's only down one decibel at 20 kHz and I doubt that you can hear that. So technically this could have been a bit better, but that's already pretty good. Now I promise to tell you a little trick to improve the technical performance of the ID44 even further. Well, if you have a professional line level signal, you can directly send it into the return and this bypasses the preamp section entirely. This is the THD plus N versus amplitude graph with the signal running through the preamp section. And here is the signal fed directly into the return input. And holy, this is getting awfully close to what I would consider a state of the art performance. The noise is reduced slightly and distortion now sits somewhere below minus 110 decibels, which is well beyond the threshold of audibility. Now, if I hadn't told you that there is a difference, you would have never known, so don't worry about feeding your audio into the preamp section. Having the gain to fine adjust the signal level is just really handy to have and that would already be a reason for me to use it instead of going straight into the return. But from a technical perspective you can get a better performance with a professional line level signal going straight into the return input. With that knowledge you shouldn't be surprised to see the same excellent 116 dB of dynamic range on the line level inputs. Running straight into the return I did even measure 119 dBA which is really really good. So I think the line level inputs are very good, especially with a typical recording level of around minus 18 to minus 12 dB. Distortion is easily inaudible and noise is extremely low with the high dynamic range of the input. And being able to route your audio through additional output gear is a really nice feature to have. I guess you're not only planning to use the interface for audio recording, but also want to listen to the audio. So let's have a quick look at the audio output performance. Frequency response wise the ID44 performs really well with a nearly completely flat frequency response meaning that all frequencies are reproduced with an equal amplitude which is exactly what you want to see for accurate sound reproduction. In terms of dynamic range Audient is dominating the chart with the ID44 Mark II closely followed by the ID14 and ID4. The ID44 delivers an extreme dynamic range of 126 decibels so it is safe to say that the noise of the output is completely inaudible. Simultaneously the distortion of the output is inaudible as well, contributing to an overall transparent performance. The maximum output level also reaches a strong 16 dBV, which I already consider a professional line level. So the only thing that you hear from the main output of the ID44 is the audio playing back, which is great news if you value accurate audio reproduction. Of course we should also take a quick look at the headphone output performance. In this mess of a table you can find all kinds of specifications, but let's focus on the important parts. Overall you can see that the ID44 has a lot of green in its measurement results, and only a few things stick out. First of all the frequency response is extremely flat again, no surprises here. The output impedance though is quite high with 22 ohms. I know this is done deliberately for a couple of reasons, but it is too high for my preference and I'd like to see something much closer to 0 ohms. With the high output impedance there is a chance that the sound can change when you use low impedance headphones. So if absolute accuracy is needed then I would advise to stick to headphones with an impedance of at least 80 ohms. One more thing I notice is that the ID44 will drive the majority of headphones without any problems, but it has a slightly lower output power compared to the ID14 and ID4, which is a bit odd considering those are USB powered and the ID44 has a separate power supply. So while the ID44 already provides ample power, it wouldn't have hurt if it had a bit more. Distortion is hardly worth talking about because it's so low it's completely inaudible and that's an excellent performance. Besides that, noise is also very low, there is virtually no chance that you will hear any noise from this output, even with sensitive headphones. The left and right channel are also equally loud, regardless where you set your gain at, and that's because the gain is digitally controlled, which I'm personally a big fan of. And the crosstalk is very good as well, indicating that the ID44 can provide a good stereo image. All in all an extremely solid headphone output performance and I would have deemed it to be transparent if it wasn't for the slightly increased output impedance. Still, 
Great stuff. Okay, I promised to show you the software and a few of its features before I wrap up this video. This is the mixer panel and you can already see that you can have multiple mixes, one master and several cue mixes. You also have the option to solo or mute individual channels and on the right side you have a few more options which can be assigned to the function buttons. Of course you can also set things like the buffer size and sample rate and here is where you also select the channel you want to use as a loopback. In the system panel you get your routing matrix and like I mentioned you can route a completely different mix to each output, even separate mixes for the two headphone outputs. By the way this mixing is done digitally so there is inevitably some amount of delay. I measured this but even with 48 kHz the latency is imperceptibly low so this is what I would consider real time monitoring and mixing. In the talkback section you can configure an input of the ID44 as the source but you can also choose any other input on your OS. So this could for example be a separate USB mic. And lastly on the left side you get a few more options like switching between ADAT and SPDIF, you can set your dim level and additionally fine adjust the balance of your rear outputs to make switching between monitors seamlessly. As you might have noticed the ID44 does not have any kind of real time audio effects on board so for things like real time amp simulation you will have to rely on the round chip latency to be low in order to not hear any delay when monitoring your audio. So here's the round chip latency with 48 kHz and different buffer sizes. And here with 96 kHz. There is much more to RTL than just latency but all in all I would say that this is a pretty solid performance. By the way the report times of the driver also matched up very precisely with the measured times which is great for those situations where your software uses the reported times for delay compensation as this will be very exact. Ok, what do I think of the ID44 Mark II? I think it's a worthy successor which delivers quite a good performance all around. There's only a small amount of things where I could see some improvements. First of all the switch for the high pass filter is only digital and thus has a slightly reduced usefulness. Like I said it would be great if you could change the frequency of the filter in the software. I'll keep you posted in the comments if that feature ever becomes available. The function buttons I also found a bit lacking with my pre-release software because I only had three functions to choose from to assign to three function buttons. I really hope that there will be more features like for example a mute for all microphone inputs or even the possibility to save a mixer preset to a button. Something like this would make the custom function buttons much more useful. Besides that there is not much to say. The audio quality of the inputs is very good with extremely low noise preamps and the audio quality of the outputs is excellent and transparent in most cases. All in all I think it's a solid interface with a good amount of IO and functionality. Ok, that's it for now. Please give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it and subscribe if you didn't already do so. There are more videos to come and I will see you all in the next one.